I just really enjoy getting groups of people together and creating something. And so the lean really helped with that too because it's about empowering the people and engaging the people. So work became, back, back when we went through our lean transition, it was with a lot of some ACM members and things like that. We kind of all did it at the same time. It was the most fun time of my career because um, what you were doing was um, getting everyone together to how do you take out the waste, how do you improve the company and engaging the workforce. And when the workforce is engaged, and especially if it's smaller teams like a cell or a full line, it's really stimulating. <laughs> A quick interruption to mind you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari. Welcome to another episode of the Made in America podcast. I am really excited to have Doug Rose, president of Aerogear, on the show today. Doug, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Ah, thank you. Well, listen, Doug, it's the Made in America podcast. Yeah. So we start off with the same two questions. What do you make and why do you make it? Yes, we make um, uh, gearboxes and uh, gearbox assemblies and detailed gears for the aerospace industry. And so what that is is on uh, uh, jet engines, uh, of course, there's an accessory gearbox on a jet engine. And, of course, in helicopters, there's the drivetrain gearboxes. So um, uh, that's our niche. And I know some people think, well, gear, they think of gears as being like a disc with teeth on them. Mm -hmm. But uh, aero aerospace gears are uh, very different, very <laughs> difficult uh, to make. And... A lot of it is the fact that they're really, um, they have to be lightweight, but yet very durable and strong and be able to take the, take the loads really well. So there's this um, uh, unusual capability of being able to be experts at both the machining and the heat treating to control the distortion and all that. So it's a, it's a real niche business. Yeah, yeah real, yeah, real niche yeah, business and, yeah. and an important one to get done right, I would think. Yes. yes we don't, we don't yes. want those uh, gearboxes failing mid-flight. I, I don't think that's good, probably. <laughs> it wouldn't be a good idea. Yeah, it would not be good. Yeah, for sure. And uh, listen, they got to be specialized. And we'll talk some more about that because it's really interesting, I think, that you, it, I believe my understanding is um, intentionally picked kind of a niche market. And I think it's sort of interesting, you know, why, why you did that uh, low those many years ago. But yes. before we get to that, uh, why do you do it? You know, what, what got you into manufacturing? What kind of, where do you get your passion from? Why? Yeah, well, um, why we do it is really, I have this like great group of people that's just really good at it. <laughs> and um, we feel like we're filling, a, filling an important need because um, uh, we're really uh, one of the best, if not the best in the world at what we do. So we got this, this niche like that. And I think what makes everybody proud is when, you know, there's thousands of flights every day with our gears in them. And sometimes it's just a particular, you know, one gear out of a gearbox. Sometimes it's the whole gearbox. And you can look up and see an airliner go over and say, you know, we, we play a role in that. It's a small role, but an important role. Mm -hmm. And you see a Black Hawk helicopter. We got gears in all the Black Hawks out there. So joint strike fight or things like that. So we're, uh, it's something to be proud. Of course, I love the manufacturing and kind of uh, in my blood is the aerospace industry. So to find a way to be part of all that, um, I think that's what drives everybody at the company. Have you always wanted to go into manufacturing? Uh, yeah, my dad had a, uh, a machine shop. Uh, and um, so I worked there, you know, as a, as a kid, teenager and stuff like that. And then went off to uh, engineering school, mechanical engineering up at the University of Vermont. And then came back, worked in his company for a little while, and uh, kind of, you know, went from there. Yeah, I've always, uh, I've, I've always just liked. Um, I think I've always liked building things. Anyhow, you know, I was always like making a go kart or something. So there's always, you know, things like that. My whole life, I'd always be like to build things. So, so it seemed like it a, a, nat a natural, yeah, uh, a natural yeah. progression. Something uh, kind of in the blood. I mean, I assume your your dad probably was a little bit like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Little tinkerers around yeah. the around the house, you know, souped up go karts and modifying skateboards or whatever. Yes, right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of that, you know, in Connecticut, it's funny, we talk to a number of different people. And we, we see some many people who kind of went a different direction, because for whatever reason, growing up, they were told or kind of thought that manufacturing wasn't going anywhere. So they went into finance or law or whatever, but somehow, you know, found their way back. But it's cool to talk to somebody who sort of always wanted to do it, always kind of had the bug to do it. 
Uh, and it seems like you must have found a way to scratch where you itch on that bug, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, th- I probably picked that up from my dad. Yeah. So, yeah. so let's talk about the beginning of, uh, of Aero Gear because uh, my understanding was it was you and a machinist and a dream, I guess. Um, so let's talk yeah. a little through that because it t- dovetails nicely into this niche concept. You, know, you said your dad owned a machine shop. So how did yeah. Aero Gear get started and, and why, uh, why that versus any other type of manufacturer? Uh, yeah, so... Um, yeah, he, he actually started out with like a couple screw machines, he had a partner right after World War II, actually, and kind of built this company. It was a fairly significant company, Windsor, Manu- Windsor Manufacturing, ended up uh, having the opportunity to sell to the Barnes Group. Mm-hmm. And then when we were doing all that, uh, I was working there closely as well um, after college and um, realized that um, the future is probably better to focus on something specific rather than general machining because it was kind of general machining and you could kind of so my dad had a chance to cash in his chips so to say and then he was an awesome uh, uh, mentor and banker to get me started right so so i had that uh i couldn't have done that how were the interest that. how were the interest rates at that actually bank? i paid him back every penny but uh with low interest low interest that's all right, <laughs> that's, all right. That's, that's all right, right. That's yeah right. yeah so i'm proud of that i think he he always had that sort of uh, approach uh, to things and so uh yeah, I uh, got yeah one. Uh, so I was able to get started in some rental space and had one machinist to myself. And of course, um, we at that time we just um, uh, splined other people's parts. So people would make an aircraft part, but then there's a spline on it. It's like little gear teeth, you know, that mm-hmm. you put on it. And uh, most companies don't have the know how to do that or the inspection equipment to do it. So it was a good niche to start out in doing that. So we would start doing that for the companies, uh, you know, around the Hartford area. And uh, did a good job, and then we finally got into the opportunity to make gears, you know, simple gears, and then more complex gears, and then into these spiral bevel gears, and then into gearbox assemblies. <laughs> so it's definitely been a, you know, crawl, uh, walk, uh, run, you know, through the whole thing. So I don't know how long it took us to get to 20 employees, but probably like five years, you know. It's yeah. like, like anything, when you start a business, you go, oh, this this will go quick. Yeah. There, there was there was a lot to learn, and uh, you know, so. Uh, you know, where'd you get the so where, did you pull the machinist out of Windsor Manufacturing? Like where did you find yeah, there the machinist? To, there happened to be a machinist at Windsor Manufacturing that knew a little bit about uh, about gears and splines. So he said, "Hey," and then he taught me how to run. The, I'd be running the machines too. We'd be running them together. And, and then back then it would be then you go you uh, you're out running the machines and you go into the office. You clean up, put on your tie, and go make a sales call <laughs> <laughs> and come back. So that's kind of how you know we got going. So, yeah. It's real bootstrapping. Yeah, it was fun though. And, I bet it was yeah. fun. And I, of course, my dad played a, a significant role in you know mentoring and coaching me and things like that too. So. And so when you when you thought about starting the business, you you, you realized I think astutely that you know being a specialist had a longer shelf life probably higher margins more staying power than than being a generalist what drove you to sort of go to the gears right off the bat i mean you sort of i mean you didn't get i guess into gear boxes right away but you were on that path with the teeth and kind of moving forward yeah was that just luck were you did you have some strategic thinking around it um uh, actually what was going on is i was working at my dad's company and um and um we had parts that had splines that needed to get put on them and we couldn't get them done anywhere. There was a one or two places that were really, in, you know, not very competent at it. And I said, uh, gee, I think there's a need here in a niche. And we did a little market research, talked to Pratt and Whitney about do they need another gear source in the area and kind of and just went from there. So mm-hmm. but it, it was, uh, um, uh, how would you say, I, I didn't realize how little, uh, you know, I'm an engineer, you know, a machinist. If your <laughs> gears can't be that hard, well, they are <laughs> <They're> really hard. <laughs> Everything's uh, like... Uh, tenths of thousands of an inch instead of a thousandths of an inch. Right. So it's, yeah. it's tight tolerances, as yeah. they say. In fact, what I used to say after I got off in my own company back to the Windsor Manufacturing guys, I'd say, hey, you know, these gears are really hard. Real men make gears. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you started in 1982. 82, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so we're, we're coming up on, what, 40 years. I know. Uh, I, 40 I, years tomorrow. Go fast. I just I just realized, I, if, you, if somebody asked me a little while ago, I said, yeah, 30-something years. You know, I just, But, uh, I, yeah, I can't believe it's coming up on 40 years. Yeah. How's the manufacturing landscape changed over those 40 years, because to me, it's really fascinating that the niche you picked in 1982 is the niche you're still in 40 years later. And that's, that's, a, that's a really smart pick, right? A little bit of luck, yeah. whatever. But yeah. that's a smart pick, because even picking niches, you know, sometimes those niches eventually fail. But 40 years, 40 years on, still going strong. Yeah, it's uh, perseverance, that's all. <laughs> like, I mean, you have to keep finding uh, opportunities. And when the landscape changed... Um, 
you know, you have to take a positive attitude to where the opportunities are so you can complain about things offshoring <laughs> at that time, offshoring or things like that. But I think we just had the attitude of, um, you know, find, you know, following the work, for example, like Pratt moved a bunch of gear work off to, uh, 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 Avio in Italy, and so we ended up turning them into a customer because we were familiar with the product. So you just, you just have to take that opportunity and keep moving after it. And I, well, I say that again. So they so they move the they move some production to Italy. Yeah. So you just go to Italy and try and, and sell them on the same right, service yeah, because you were you, doing because you already know the specs, and you know how to make the parts and all that sort of stuff. So you can follow you know you can follow the opportunity. There's opportunities um, as long as you stick at it and find a way, and that's what we always tried to do. I think the other thing that we always did was um, try to keep moving up the food chain and uh, like more more value added. So um, so I would view people don't come to us as much for uh, we're more of a knowledge based business now. People don't come to us just for uh, doing the machining. They're coming to us because we're experts on gears. So we know more about gears than you know than <laughs> uh, than m most of the large companies. You know because it's our expertise what we do every day. So they'll come to us and say, Hey, we're doing this new design. We're doing this. You know what? You know that sort of thing. So um, it, it, being an expert in a niche um, has it gets you out of the just competing against like uh, uh, exaggerating but cutting time on the equipment and stuff like that it gets you into this next level. So. so do you, I mean, so is that a service that you guys sell? Is like the, a consulting service or is that just sort of pre-engineering to, you know, time, sort of biz dev time to then get the work? I mean, that, that, it's that, yeah. Yeah. It, just, uh, just, um, be in the place that they go to, that they have confidence and you know what, you, what, you, what uh, we're doing. And yeah, we, we're, um, we're working at building a design department now, but we actually have not been really a, have a design department, but we're, uh, we're in the process of doing that now. So, yeah. so pivoting there. So, I mean, so how has the business, I mean, clearly you kind of ran through going from, you know, just sort of make, helping other people's parts to entire gearbox assembly. So clearly that's changed. Yeah. But how else has the business changed between 1982 and, and 2022? Um, you know, obviously technology, uh, you know, keeping up with technology. And um, I would say the industry as a whole, though, um, has been... Um, a little bit of a challenge in that the whole global aspects of things and it being such a global industry and then uh, trying to stay uh, relevant as a small company uh, in a global market right so so the you know the industry changed a lot like uh, you know back when we were uh, I mean 20 years ago it was all these little small shops around a lot of them have gone out of business right and a lot of them also been bought up by larger corporations all the roll-ups and mm -hmm. things so uh, it's I mean it's obviously changed a lot so there aren't there aren't too many um, small, mid-sized companies that doing aerospace parts that have stayed independent, which there's not a lot in the Hartford area. Yeah, so you know, lot, looking yeah. at groups like Barnes and Whitcraft and whatever that right. have kind of yeah. consolidated a lot of those things. Yeah. So has that opened up opportunities? You know, sometimes when there's a consolidation, you know, if the market's still there and the market itself is growing, there can be some real great opportunities for small players who can be a little bit more nimble and exactly. get some extra work. You found yeah, that to be exactly true? Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah, definitely. They come to us not just for our uh, expertise, but uh, I always say we're a highly responsive, high tech, lean leader in our niche. Right. So mm -hmm. that's why I think I can honestly say we're the, really one of the, if not the best in the world, if a customer wants something quick, we can give it to them. It's a very focused product. And so. That's, that's really cool. Going, what, what, yeah. Let's talk about the technology for a second. I mean, that's near and dear to yeah. my heart oh, personally. Okay. So I love yeah. tech. So, but you know, when you talk about new technology everywhere, I mean, everything from your, you know, ERP systems, MRP, are right? you guys leveraging that different yeah. machine, obviously machines I'm sure have changed. Share yeah. a little bit about what you've seen in some of the technology and what you think has made real impacts that you've invested in your business. Yeah. You're right in that uh, people tend to think of the technology just being in the machines, but it's on all the other support functions too. So, you know, like in IT, just on all the inspection records. And but um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, also uh, like inspection equipment, the um, things that used to take us um, I don't know an hour a piece to inspect. Now it's like thirty seconds with <laughs> optical uh, scanning and all this. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep up with that. I think we invest in technology. Basically, when it makes real common sense to um, uh, to increase the flow of the product. So, so, in other words, so we're set up in like flow lines, producing mm -hmm. parts, and and we tend to look at the uh, how would you say it the uh, the overall output of let's say the the flow line or the cell, and then whenever you're reaching a point where the um, volume's got to go up, you have to your tack time goes down, and you're trying to produce more. 
then the first thing you have to say is, well, how can we do this with the same people and the same, you know, that? So, so it forces you to invest in technology. It's not always in the next milling machine or something like that that's a little faster. It's quite often in the inspection or something like that um, because it's, it's a matter of, uh, you know, um, uh, flowing the product quickly and making the meet customer demand. Yeah, sure. So, Listen, right, you got I mean, you got to look at the whole process flow and you, yeah. if you just if you only keep optimizing the same area, you're just going to create a bottleneck somewhere else. So, yeah. if we want to get more pieces out, we got to figure out where that bottleneck is. So, it doesn't matter how many pieces I can mill on the machine if my inspection's taking an hour per machine is only 24 hours in a day. If I'm working 7 days a week, then I'm stuck at 24 parts, right? Yeah, um, exactly right. Add more inspection. Yeah. So, that's that's exactly cool. Right. I yeah. mean, when you guys think about the technology cuz one one thing I have to imagine that you would agree with, but open the door for you to disagree, yeah. is that without investing in technology, improving processes, you know, lean, AeroGear wouldn't be successful. Oh, we would have been out of business a long time ago. Yeah. I, yeah. So how do you institutionalize that? You know, it's like everyone talks about it, but how do you, how do you, how have you been so successful at it? How have you institutionalized that philosophy of embracing change and new technology? Yeah. Um, I think it's mostly just having the philo just the philosophy of continuous improvement mm -hmm. and uh, teamwork and um, and flow in the product. So when I think of lean, I'm actually thinking what you're trying to do is to um, flow the product and take out waste and just um, you know just keep doing that uh, uh, relentlessly. You know, and, and you know we all have our we all have our ups and downs in doing it, but but generally, if you uh, so you said to, to sustain it. It's got to be like in your DNA and your mm -hmm. core values and what you're trying to do as a business. And when new people come in, they just feel it. And they, you know, I, which reminds me, I think one of the reasons why I like business so much is the teamwork. You know, like if you had to say, why does Doug really like what he does? I, I just really enjoy getting groups of people together and creating something. And so the lean really helped with that too, because it's about empowering the people and engaging the people. So work became, back, back when we went through our lean transition, it was with a lot of some ACM members and things like that. We kind of all did it at the same time. It was the most fun time of my career because um, what you were doing was um, getting everyone together to how do you take out the waste, how do you improve the company, and engaging the workforce. And when the workforce is engaged, and especially if it's smaller teams like a cell or a full line, it's really stimulating. It's really fun. Yeah. And, uh, that, yeah. I remember, I remember Your, saying like, the face is yeah. lighting yeah. up. You <laughs> love it. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, uh, I think that's probably why I do what I do. I just enjoy that a lot. Yeah. When you, so you, let's talk about, you, you brought up the ACM, uh, which I do want to talk about as well, because, uh, you know, you're, you're known as one of the founding fathers uh, of the yeah. ACM. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but was it, was it the group that sort of got you to think about lean? Like, how did your lean journey start? What, 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 what sort of inspired uh -huh. you to do it? Yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, so initially, uh, it got pushed on us by uh, by uh, one of our customers, right? Uh, pushed on us, and I was kind of reluctant and a skeptic at first. Were you? Yeah. yeah. It's, fu it's funny to hear you say that, because right now, you're like an oh, evangelist. Yeah, a I, yeah, yeah, yeah. A zealot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so they had um, a Shingazitsu guy come to our factory, and... Um, and kind of talking to us, and you know, I got, I would just like, you know, go ahead and argue with them. You know, we have this. Really? Things. Oh yeah, yeah. Just you know, I'm not. So whenever you get a new initiative, you have to adopt it in a way that fits. And uh, his name's Mr. Doy, still still a friend today, and um, and so he came to our company, and he just somehow got me to see uh, the difference. And then from then on, when he did Kaizans at Pratt & Whitney, so they thought he'd just come for an hour, but he'd do Kaizans uh, over at Pratt, and I would go pick him up when he was done on Friday. Um, you know, noontime and bring him back to our factory to get more. So he, he, he I, I owe, I owe it to him to uh, get us, uh, you know, really up and going and thinking completely differently. So, do you remember? Yeah. Do you remember the light bulb moment? Like, do you remember when you were like, "Oh, shit, this does work." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I, it was, uh, it was discussing our scheduling board with him way back when how we're planning all the. Uh, all the parts and all the different machines and everything. He said, you should take a picture of this because this will be in a museum someday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he was saying, you really just have to connect everything up to flow. And of course, we all read the book Lean Thinking back mm -hmm. then. So I guess I really owe it to Pratt & Whitney, to be honest with you, about, about the initiative, them um, promoting it, and rather than be the guy that's uh, like uh, resisting it to... Uh, uh, see it, understand the philosophy, and then adapt it in a way that fits our company, and it just changed us. And I remember I had people at the company back then saying, you know, if we didn't do this, we probably wouldn't have made it in business, you know, so. Your efficiency is king. Did you, yeah. did you find that once you embraced it, 
Was it easy? I mean, how many people were working at Aerogear at the at the time? Do you remember? Probably like a hundred or something. Something like, like that. that. Yeah, yeah. So you know, yeah. getting a hundred people to change their way of thinking yeah. and the way they do things that ain't easy. No, we had a lot of fun with that actually. <laughs> a lot of fun with that. So um, we uh, decided we were going to do it. And we took a family of parts. They're actually uh, oil pumping gears, and we were making a lot of them at the time. And we said, well, let's set up a cell just for that. And at, our, at the time, um, anyhow, we set up this uh, cell in the factory, and we uh, we epoxied the floor and put the machines in. And the, the team of like six or eight people that were doing it, we, whatever they wanted, they got, you know. And um, and so all and uh, they, all, they actually all read the book. These are like machines and stuff. They all read the book, Lean Thinking, and they were all really engaged. And we took a trip up to like Pratt Canada to see what they were doing and some of the other. Uh, um, uh, Jake break things like that. So anyhow, everyone was really engaged. And then, then what happened was, so you'd go into our shop at the time. It was uh, except for that, it was kind of like you know, I wouldn't say dingy, but it was like old manufacturing, right? Mm-hmm. But then in the middle of the plant was this cell that's about maybe I don't know how big, but you know maybe. 15 machines or something and it was like an oasis and all this bright light and everything was nice and clean <laughs> and then um and the people were all engaged and uh and we were you know banging out parts and seeing r- big improvements and everyone said can i work there you know so then uh, we started changing over the whole factory so it was a little a little pilot and it just took off but yeah well that i mean that's that's a that's a great story doug and I, it's yeah. just so funny right when you want to have change it's a great lesson i think in all kinds of change right which is sort of start small make it successful, show it off. And then if it's good and it works, it will just sort of take on a life of its own. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's actually making people's lives better. Do you know what I mean? It's not like management pushing, you should do this. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's that these, you know, people uh, enjoyed being a uh, herd, you know, they, they knew how to make things better, better than we did. So it wasn't a man, they owned it, you know, and uh, it was really fun. Yeah. And that, and then how? Then you sort of saw the whole business over a period of time, just sort of like yeah, changing us, over. Yeah, it took us probably you know a few years, you know three three or four years to do the whole business. And now when you come to the business, the material comes in one end, um, all cut to length from a guy who we do a barcode to, and he shows the material shows up and it goes out the other end, um, you know, completed gears. And so it's, <laughs> it's fun. pretty amazing. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. cool. Oh, it even made us bring in our own heat treat because we wanted to uh, flow, right? So you, mm-hmm. what are our obstacles we had to go out for heat treat so then we became experts at heat treat and then that new technology then makes us better as a gear manufacturer so it kind of keeps feeding on itself can you just talk i think a lot of people listening know what flow is but just really quickly can you just maybe talk about about flow in this context and what you mean by it yeah yeah i know people hear about the we actually did things like one piece flow and that's the optimum way where you're taking apart and doing it like um um, you know, op 10, op, a lathe, another lathe, a, uh, let's say a gear shaper, a milling machine. And you, and instead of having it be that you're scheduling the lathe department and the milling department and the gear shaping department and moving the hardware around, you're just lining up the machines in the sequence of the manufacturing. And all of a sudden, what used to take you three weeks to move around the factory is now two hours. You, you start it on the lathe and it's coming off the milling machine at the end of the cell. And so, um, so it's sort of that's, staying away from batching, right? You don't just take yeah. like 50 parts, bring them to the milling department, then they mail the 50 parts, then you move it over here. You yeah. try to get that one part all the way through. What we ended up settling on at Aero Gear that works really well for us is we do like small batch flow rather than one piece flow. So with Mr. Doy and everything back then, we actually were doing one piece flow. We proved you can make a gear from bar stock uh, to shipment in 36 hours. You know, we actually proved we could do that. You know, <laughs> wow. uh, but it was you couldn't we couldn't sustain it. We still it's just uh, you know the the variation in the product and things like that. So you do so. But we ended up settling after a lot of uh, uh, fights with Mr. Doy. <laughs> uh, settling is like uh, small batches so we'll do like a batch of 10 or 15 parts and that's almost like one piece flowing through the uh, the flow line mm-hmm. so first one part number goes through a batch of let's say 10 or 15 pieces and then another part number and um, they kind of take about the same uh, process going through and, and you do that yeah. because there are slight variations between who you're making it for so it's is that what it is yeah and the, and the the parts uh, the processes aren't identical so so I'm doing yeah. a little bit different yeah. to get that variation. Yeah, and that's the thing. But so when there's when there's an initiative like that, like uh, the lean and what you should do, like even someone like as wonderful as Mr. Joy come in and saying you should do a certain thing, you end up uh, a, if you believe in the principle and the philosophy. So I always say, what do I believe in? Flow in the product and continuous improvement and uh, and engaging the people, right? So you you say, well, we're not going to do. The, sorry, Mr. Joy, we're not going to do the one piece flow because we don't find it really. We we find we get more output and we satisfy our customers more by doing our own version. So we modify it a little bit so i think if you 
believe in the principles, then find a way to fit your company. I think that, that's the that's, that's the take. that's yeah. the take for success. Yeah. Well, it's working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. You, you know, clearly you've learned that learning from others uh, can be really helpful in business. Yeah, right. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so, talk a little bit about the aerospace component manufacturers group ACM. Um, you know, talk about what, what caused you to start it and, and, you know, yeah. just kind of go from there. Yeah. Um, there was an initiative back then about, uh, clusters like economic development going into, you know, mm-hmm. forming clusters. And, um, and I kind of, uh, you know, believed a lot in that. And you just like, you know, every, every part of the country, you have Silicon Valley, it does their thing. And you have Detroit that does their thing. What do we have here in Connecticut? We have this natural cluster of, uh, of um, aerospace companies that's been around a long time. And I, I th- kind of felt it, came, it kind of needed to be uh, uh, nurtured a little bit because we were all these individual companies um, doing what we do. And if we could uh, collaborate together and share information, we were all like little islands back then. So I think it started with like six guys that, you know, all owned the shops and stuff. And we started getting together and started saying, hey, how could we uh, work better together? And um, with the attitude that, um, Everything was going global back then. You know, you're not my competitor. The guy down the street is not the competitor. It's uh, Poland, Singapore, all these other China. That's the competition. And what, what we have is something pretty uh, unique here in, in Connecticut where we have this natural cluster that we could all work together. Because it's raw material, it's special processes, it's the manufacturers, mm-hmm. and of course some great customers uh, lo- located too. So I think we ended up with the attitude of, um, of improving our, com- the main theme was how do we, uh, improve our competitiveness and how do we work together to improve our competitiveness and we ended up uh, working on like you know four legs business development in other words and back then it was as simple as just sharing contacts hey do you know who i talked to at uh, this other company where i might be able to and you share share that so there's business development which end up turned out going to air shows and stuff too mm-hmm, right but mm-hmm. but back then that was the beginning and then workforce development was a big deal back then and people don't realize how far that's come because back then the uh, community colleges and the technical schools had their own agenda and and there wasn't it wasn't demand driven so so they would teach what they thought was the right thing to teach with <laughs> very little regard for what was going on in the companies and we've come so far and it's, it's so great now to see like as nuntuck now mm-hmm. but as nuntuck manufacturing wasn't even a uh, program wasn't even there you know mm-hmm. and so getting uh, uh connecting up with the um with the educators and that to uh, give us the raw material that we want, right? And then there was, so that was workforce development. And um, then the progressive manufacturing stuff was basically doing Kaizans. Mm-hmm. And we would get like Mr. Doyen for a week and do at, uh, have him do Kaizans at three or four different companies and then cross pollinate doing Kaizans that, you know, we'd send people to one company and they'd send people to ours and kind of, so the, the progressive manufacturing was that. Um, so anyhow, I think uh, I don't even know what the original no, question was. I'm just kind of yeah. excited, kind of excited about it. We just had a great uh, group of people all committed to um, being more competitive and doing the right thing, and it was wonderful. The state, you know, the uh, DECD was kind of helping us get it all started. And so, but it was a very natural thing that needed to happen. And uh, and if it wasn't also if it wasn't for the state uh, kind of facilitating it, it wouldn't. It kind of gave it you know credibility in the beginning. It funded the initial uh, beginnings of it. I always thought what the state did smart too was they always have you cost share. You know, even when they uh, would give us um, uh, some benefits, it would always be a fifty percent cost share. So then people are you know put their own skin, their in, the own skin in the game yeah. and want to make it work and. Yeah, yeah. Those, and, those, those and are, anybody who's time. ever had kids knows the importance of cost share, right? Putting, yeah. putting get in, they got to have some skin yeah. in the game. They look at everything very differently, yeah. Yeah. Uh, even if yeah. it's just a little thing. And but, so those of us, we used to get together and, and uh, you know, get together for dinner and things like that. And, and, what is it about, you know, it's a, it's a really special group. I mean, you, you touched on what's there. Uh, the members are so passionate uh, about the group. That's, that's something you don't, you don't always see. Mm-hmm. Everyone feels like they get a ton of, of value out of it. People do a, a lot of great best practices, sharing. Right. Um, and it, it seems like it's just such a tight-knit group closely guarded um in terms of protecting each other but but also working together even though there's some competitive some competitiveness there right yep Yep. um i I just don't know if you could maybe talk about how did you guys bridge that gap you know other people in other industries myself included have been like how could we replicate that but they're just i'm not sure what the special sauce is but there does seem to be one yeah I, i think it just uh yeah 
and it's that thing about just you're better off together than apart, Part. even though someone's a competitor and you probably end up being uh, having a closer relationship with another company that isn't a direct competitor that's, um, you know, and so you end up building like a little, almost like sub networks inside the organization. <laughs> so if there's like, you know, 80 companies in there, there's probably, you know, three or four that you do things uh, tightly with and then some that you, you know, there's well, still it's got, competition. It's got, so. started at six people. It's 140 yeah. Yeah, or something I now. What it is now. It's, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a lot, yeah, yeah it's yeah, hard to, to yeah. keep close tabs. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, your kind of transition through, you know, the COVID ups and downs, you know, it's, yeah. it's something clearly aerospace impacted in a different way than, than other businesses. Right. Um, of course, aerospace also a little bit more familiar with the boom and bust cycles, uh, probably generally, right. but I just maybe talk through from your perspective, how did you manage through it? How did you rally the team to, to sort of sustain the body blows, yeah. but still feel good about coming back? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was the most, challenging year in all my years to be honest with you really so we stayed open through the whole thing um and uh you know so you know typically a business like ours and most of the acm companies it's like 50 percent commercial and 50 percent military kind of and uh, i think we entered it with like 60 percent commercial wrong way to be <laughs> you know heading in and um so the military work kind of stayed stable but the commercial just uh just off a cliff yeah right yeah right off a cliff so we uh, lost, uh, you know, 30, th at least 30%, maybe 35% of our revenues like overnight, like within a month, right? So you got, you got no choice but, uh, uh, you know, size the business right and all that. So it was a pain, you know, painful time to, uh, to go through. But what I've always learned a uh, long time ago is that, um, you know, you do it once. And that's what we did. So we kind of said, hey, we can, we're, gonna, we're definitely going to, um, uh, you know, ride through this. We're going to survive through it. Um, but, um, you know, most likely we'll end up being at such and such a revenue, you know, down 30% for the next, you know, year at least. So let's size the company right. Let's not wring our hands over, over it and just do it. So we did that. And our priorities became um, uh, keeping everybody healthy, number one, the number one priority, and conserving cash um, uh, to make it you know, through to the other side. And those became our priorities. And, uh, yeah, we were really successful. We, we uh, right away... Um, uh, very early on, probably even before most people, we were because uh, we were in work and all the time separated everybody. You know, we got of course wearing masks, and but then also uh, getting people out into open spaces and nobody within six feet and all that. And um, I remember a lot of the people even at the time they they were a little slow to react and we're kind of insisting, no, we have to do this, and we we got through it. So actually, we ended up being okay. You know, we we had uh, we didn't have any um, employee to employee transfer. We had people obviously get it like you know everywhere else outside, mm -hmm. but then we were very careful about um, making sure they stayed out for two weeks when that happened and all that. So, uh, yeah, we were, we rode through it. And um, the good news is it's coming back for us now. I mean, aerospace is um, is not um, you know it's got a long ways to go back, like another couple of years before it's back where it is. But um, uh, you know we're we're uh, we're we're back doing okay and back growing a little bit. I mean you know so we're we're working our way out and things are coming back and we have a lot, a lot of promising things going on now. I try to take the attitude whenever you're in a situation like you're in is you know uh, my guys would hear hey times of change are times of opportunity. So there's some opportunity out here. There's going to be competitors who fail or there's going to be some disruption in the industry and let's just be there and and ready to do it. And some of that panned out. So um, you know you have to. Have that have that attitude about it, and sure enough, we're coming. You know, we're coming back now. That's know? great. Yeah, yeah, listen. Every time, yeah. uh, every time something, every time something happens, good or bad, there's opportunity if you're willing to be uh, to be open to it. Yeah. Um, what's your philosophy for kind of running the business? Do you do you subscribe to you know EOS or scaling up or kind of any of those uh, those systems? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're into the EOS now. Have been for uh, two or three years or. And it's really working out well for us. Um, and of course, um, before that, we were doing the, the lean strategy and things like that, using the policy deployment and all. And uh, but what I've found, um, uh, what's working out well with the EOS is uh, a little better, like accountability and a little clearer vision of where we're going. And uh, it's been really helpful. Um, 
So does um, it complement mm -hmm. sort of the lean continuous improvement? Do you, is there a conflict there, or you think they're really aligned and can work well together? No, I, I think they they go okay because one of the things in the EOS you do is you get your core values and you and you start like driving that, and it has you, it has you like uh, kind of brainstorm with your leadership team. Well, what are our core values? And you, you get them. So in some ways, it complements it. You mm -hmm. define, you know, we have ours and everything. And what you're really trying to do is to uh, define the culture of the company in your core values, and that becomes your approach um, right. of, of how to how to move forward. So I don't think they conflict at all. But the, so one of the strong things about that was yeah, getting it really clear. What you, ours was already pretty clear, but what's your target in the market? Mm -hmm. um, what are your core values? Meaning like how do you plan to run in the business? Is with us, it's like you know, a teamwork and CI and no drama <laughs> and. Uh, find a way and uh, sweat the details. So those are, and, but I could tell, rather than be bullets, I think I could explain to you what that means. I'm not gonna do it right now, but <laughs> explain to you what that means about who we want as people and what our culture is like. Because if you, if you don't, if you think of it that way, what we're trying to describe the whole thing about teamwork and continuous improvement and all that, if you're do, if we're doing that, that's what drives the company. So there's that part of EOS that's really good. And um, I think the wonderful part about EOS too is they break things into like you set your annual goals, which we just did last week, actually. It was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. So we got our goals for the year. And then um, we, we kind of always did a similar thing, but you break it into quarterly 90 day rocks. They call mm -hmm. them rocks. Like in other words, what am I to get to such and such at, in a year? That means this quarter I have to accomplish this. And basically everybody he gets a rock you know, yep. to move the company forward that's right. continuous improvement so so again i think i just buy into the philosophy of the eos like the philosophy lean and then kind of drive that um keep driving that the philosophy and you end up getting the right output you know so listen i you know i i love talking to a business owner who's been successful over a, over a long period of time but who's continually looking at new ways to get better and, and maybe that's part of the reason you have been successful for 40 years is yeah. uh, is always kind of improving um, and I know we're kind of running out of time but I just want to ask you a couple things you referenced before sort of the global market mm -hmm. um, and I think for many of us especially people in manufacturing you know it does feel like it's a lot more global than it ever was before and it's probably going to get more so or, or maybe yeah. not yeah. I just wonder your thoughts around sort of competing in a global market you know offshoring reshoring I'm just curious what you're seeing from your perspective on all that um, yeah um, I think it's one of the um, um, battles that we have here in Connecticut is you'll have uh, companies thinking well I, I can't come to you because you live in a, you're in expensive Connecticut so obviously I'm not going to get a low cost I'm not going to get the global price I can go to Poland or Singapore and get it a lower price and what I spent a lot of time convincing them it's not true it's all about productivity so we have highly skilled people here we have the technology yeah our costs are a little higher but we're twice as productive we are I, I go to the other factories that I what I'm talking about and I see them and they are very inefficient you know compared to what we're doing with the lean and the technology and so we can we compete globally all the time so getting this fallacy from some of the let's say larger corporations who think um, you can't come to Connecticut. It's just not true. You just have to. You have to go to good companies in Connecticut. And the, by the way, the if you're not good, you're probably gone. <laughs> so so there's good companies in Connecticut that can compete all day long with the competition overseas. Yeah, listen. I mean, I, I believe in that concept of of sort of that's why efficiency is so critical. And it's not just in in manufacturing, but you referenced something called the global price. And I think the internet. One of the things the internet has done yeah. is created sort of a market price that's sort of irrespective of where you are because someone can just go Google it or Amazon right. it or whatever and the price is there and the same is true in, in services, it's, in, it's true in manufacturing. So then this says, okay, the price is the price. Yeah. So what do I have to do? I gotta figure out how can I produce and at a level of efficiency that's gonna give me enough margin between what I can do right. and what the global price is. I mean, that's, I mean, it's pretty simple. You describe that perfectly. <laughs> no, seriously, that was, that's exactly right. And getting, and getting people to understand that is really important, yeah. Yeah, it's huge. And and yeah. one way to, you know, and to your point, one way to do it is to just look at cutting costs, cutting costs, cutting costs. But long term, that's probably not a winning strategy. Mm -hmm. Productivity and effect, efficiency and effectiveness is going to yeah. be a better strategy long term. And AeroGear kind of proves that out. Yeah. Yeah. What's the uh, just last thing I want to talk about a little bit is the is the culture you've built at AeroGear. I'm just curious, how would you describe it? Or maybe more accurately, I'll ask you this. How do you think an employee like a you know, a, a newer employee has been there maybe a year or two. How do you think they would describe the culture at AeroGear? Um, definitely a, a, a teamwork uh, place, a, a place where um, 
uh, a great place to work, a uh, place where your coworkers are supporting you to be successful. Um, definitely, they would be saying, yeah, and we're driven towards um, always wanting to do better, continuous improvement and growing. And uh, I would like to think they'd say it's satisfying, uh, satisfying working there because it's such a nice, we, have, we honestly just have a great group of people. You know, we, we really do. And, and, and people come in, they go, this is one of the best places I ever worked because of and it's that feeling of, um, I think what it is too, it's that whole thing about, um, you know, treating everybody with respect and, and um, just uh, everybody in it together. Uh, I think there's definitely that feeling in the company. So you're proud actually, of, actually, you're yeah, proud I'm very that. proud of that. Yeah. That's, in fact, uh, the one thing I'm most proud of here is our culture. I, th- they hear that all the time. I, you know, I'm most proud of the, the people there and the culture we have. Yeah. That's awesome, Doug. Listen, uh, it, it's been uh, it's been great hearing about. It. I, I have to say, your your passion, uh, the way your eyes light up when you talk about it, it's 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 contagious and it's really really inspiring. I think the audience okay. hopefully will get will get uh, a ton out of it. So yeah. I'm going to move to our uh, rapid fire round of questions. Oh. You ready? Sure. All right, here we go. Red Sox or Yankees? Uh, Red Sox. Yeah. Starbucks or Dunkin'? Dunkin'. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Staycation or exotic destination? Probably exotic. <laughs> yeah. Sports car or SUV? SUV. Do you have a favorite business book? Uh, yeah, uh, probably. There's a few, but uh, Good to Great comes to mind at first. Yeah, that's yeah. a great one. Yeah. Um, Doug, if you had to do something other than be president of Aerogear, and you had to do it, and it could be anything in the whole world, what would you do? Um. It would be something to do with like uh, outdoor adventures. I, I to uh, you know that you know go climbing some mountains somewhere <laughs> on a canoe trip or you know that sort of thing. It would be it would be if I ha- that would be my other career that I could have done. Like I always said when I was young, I would have liked to have been an outward bound instructor. You know something uh, like that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, so, I, we didn't I really get into it no, in the show, but you're no. UVM UVM <laughs> graduate, big time Okemo skier. I mean, you've got that uh, adventurous spirit uh, yeah. in the blood for sure. Yeah. Um, what's something Doug, that you learned early in your life or early in your career that you think's propelled you to all the success you've had? Um, I would say, uh, you know, mostly perseverance. Um, and uh, I guess the other thing is I probably talked a little bit about it was um, uh, early on I realized that when the, when the industry, I call it customers, uh, push something on you, like a new initiative, whether it be uh, lean, we happen to talk about <laughs> lean, whether it be lean or anything like that, you want to be the person uh, not being uh, pushed along by your customer. You want to be, you want to be the person pulling the wagon, mm-hmm. and then and then embracing that in a way that um, um, that fits your company, rather than just saying uh, yes, that's what I'll, I'll you know don't just accept it. In fact, modify it um, to use it. And I think I learned that early on. It really worked out well for us. So our customers always enjoyed the fact that we're embracing change, right? And then we're not going to take some change that doesn't benefit our company, just that benefits, let's say, them. You know, right. Right? So you adapt it. In a way, but there's always a way to adapt it in a positive way. So I, I would think I learned that fairly early on, and I'm you know, kind of proud that we were always able to do that no matter what comes at us. So. That's really good. Yeah. What's something, Doug, that you learned later in your life, or later in your career, that if you went back and told young Doug, and if young Doug would have listened to you, it'd really make a positive impact on him. Yeah, um, yeah. It's only been in recent years I've uh, come to the uh, realization that you can always adjust the company to make money. So there's almost like no uh, no excuse to lose money in a company. So you um, kind of no matter what happens, you can always adjust your expenses to uh, um, you know based on your revenues. And when I was younger, I went through a couple downturns, uh, you know, when I was a long time ago. They go through a couple of downturns and uh, hoping what the revenues might be like, gee, I don't really want to cut back now. I don't want to do this because it's kind of painful and I want to. And then uh, hoping the revenues. But you have, to, you have to build your business on what you know the revenues are going to be. And if it's up from there, um, then great. Uh, you know, then it's just better. But, but not fa- So it's about facing the reality of the marketplace mm-hmm. and adjusting accordingly. 
So I was a little slow to learn that, but I, I, I made it through with like two big downturns, and then I learned, hey, duh, you, you got to do this, uh, you got to do this early, which kind of helped us. If I hadn't had that experience, I think COVID would have had a different story for us. Wow, yeah. that's great. You know, again, once again, learning from the background. It's funny, it reminds me of yeah. one of my business mentors who always says to me, "Hope is not a strategy, Ari. Right, Hope right, is not yeah. a strategy." Yeah. Um, so I'm feeling that, Doug. Thank you so very much for uh, coming on today. It was really a, a pleasure to talk to you. A pleasure, pleasure being here. It was great to be with you. Thanks. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by IT Direct, a Compass MSP company. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and spending some time with me today. You know, my goal is to help build a community where we can learn and grow together. Your input, feedback, and engagement is critical to making that happen. Please do comment, like, and subscribe so more and more people can hear what we're doing and join our community of growth and success. Thanks so much for tuning in. Talk to you again soon.